Braith Kelly. Uh, here with my old friend Greg Meyerson. How you doing? Uh, for those who don't know Greg, Greg currently holds the world record all tackle striped bass. 81.3 pound. 81.88, but who's counting? Right. right. There and it's is. not my favorite record, by the way. The Beatles' White Album is. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, so, I digress. Yeah, Greg, Greg uh, starts off a long, long time ago chasing fish down in... I, I, I came out of the womb with a fishing rod in my That's hand. That's it. That's, That's it. what my mother said anyway. I don't believe that. Yeah. But by the time he turned 10... He was out hitting it hard, trying to get a boat. Yeah. Uh, wanted to talk about your muskrats and. Yeah, which is kind of a crazy story. Uh, my parents were from the city. My father was from Brooklyn. Uh, they they met um, at a party. My mother was a widow. Uh, my her my brother's father. My brother was a year old. His father died in Vietnam and. So she was uh, at a party. My father had just come home from Vietnam and was staying with his parents next door to her. And they met, fell in love, had me, bought a house, built a house out in the country. And I was a hillbilly, you know. I was totally different than anyone in the family, you know. So I grew up in farm country and in the woods, fishing and hunting. And, you know, my father would pull in. He was actually a bookie for the mob, owned package stores, was in the liquor business. You know, he was in all kinds of shit. And, uh, like, he would get out of the Cadillac with his leisure suit on, and I'd be boiling traps in the backyard with a with beeswax from the neighbor, you know, trying to make them faster, you know, so I could trap as many muskrats as I could and, and uh, buy my first Brockway boat, with Earl Brockway, custom built for me. And like, times were different then. Like, I don't, I don't see a 10-year-old doing that today, but... I was always driven to get what I wanted any way I could, whatever I had to do. And we were full of muskrats, and I had uh, some, some kids in the neighborhood that were doing it, and they were telling me they were getting 12 bucks a piece for them, and I was all in. You know, what do I got to do? So, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I learned how to trap at age 9, and I had my boat by age 10. So you started out fishing on a Brockway, your first boat. Yep, 17 with a 30-horse Evinrude, 1968. That's interesting. That's the first boat I ever fished on. Belonged to my uncle. Really? And, uh, Great boat. <clears throat> yeah, he let me run the boat, uh, pull his traps, catch stripers in Narragansett Bay, and then my brother took it, and he ran it for a while until he broke all the ribs, and uh, it got hauled out, and that was the end of Ernie's Envy. <laughs> That's what you called it? <laughs> That's it, Ernie's Envy. <laughs> I don't remember the backstory, but I'm sure it's funny. Yeah, yeah, I... I I actually, I mean, my Brockway just came apart after about 10 years. It just, you know, I held it together with roofing tar and roofing nails and, man, anything I could slap on that thing to make it last another, you know. So you kept your boats down, down mid, mid sound Connecticut back then? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I had the worst slip, too. I think I paid the guy. Uh, the guy felt bad for me. I was a kid with this piece of crap boat and just wanted to fish every day. And he, he I guess he saw the enthusiasm and... Gave me a slip dirt cheap, but in low tide, the thing was sitting in mud, you know? So I had to always try to get there when there was some kind of a tide, you know? So I could drag the thing, at least if I had to, with a rope along the dock. Um, but it was dirt cheap. Good boats. Had a lot of fun on them. Yeah. I'm actually looking to find one now. I want one, but they're, they're hard to come by. You know, most of the ones you see have uh, flowers planted them in someone's yard, right? That's right. That's right. That's it. <laughs> well, we can build one. We can get to that. Yeah, that'd be great. <clears throat> yep. So jump forward. Sure. Long way. You're messing around with lobsters in a tank, <laughs> trying to figure out how to catch more and bigger bass. Right. Well, so I you know, I, I started fishing with a, uh, a guy named Vern Carlson, uh, who, who got me hooked on striped bass fishing. No pun intended. Um, and... I lived for it, you know. All, all of a sudden, you know, I've always been a fisherman for everything. I still, I, I'm more of a trout fisherman now than I've ever been. Uh, but striped bass at that point was my passion, and I was always trying to figure out how to catch them, um, bigger ones and more, and what could I do. And I always found that having noisy swivels and noisy gear made better fishing because 
I didn't know why at the time. I just knew that it worked. A little bit of sound, a little bit of sound helped. And um, so the first, the, the first thing I did was to try to add sound to uh, uh, my drift when I'm drifting eels. You know, you know, when you're drifting eels, you're coming along, you're coming up to the rip, everything's quiet, you're coming along. I'm like, if there's a fish there, he sees it. But if there's a fish 10 feet on either side, it's not going to see it. It's not, you know. So I wanted to bring a little sound in, and I didn't want it to be something that would scare, scare the fish away. So most of the big striped bass that I caught by the time I was 20 had lobster in there. So I knew they were the big ones were lobster eaters, you know, and I wanted to. I I, I come from a sci, I was a uh, natural resource major at the University of Rhode Island, and I I was a, uh, always into the biology and this and that. So and a hobby of mine was listening to stuff with my hydrophone underwater. Like I'm a big sound guy, you know. Like I won't even watch a movie if it doesn't have a good soundtrack. Like Dances with Wolves has a great soundtrack, right? Like movies like that, I'll watch them for the sound. I like listening to the sounds of things that animals and water and bugs make walking on a blade of grass. You could hear that if you listen to it with the right equipment. Hmm. Now, that's cool. You know, I don't like drowned out traffic, planes. I just want quiet, you know, and, and listening to sound, real sounds. So get back to the rattlesinker. Um, I knew that these fish could hear these lobster somehow, so I recorded the lobster um, in, a, in a tank with a hydrophone in there, and I would walk into the room and stir them up with a hockey stick, and they would start clicking, and it was coming off their antennas. So it was a, it was a, and what it is is a, uh, it's a sound to warn other lobsters of a predator around, right? So the striped bass. Who is near? All fish are nearsighted; they can't really see well. They listen for what they eat. So, uh, in a sense, I created a fish call. Mm -hmm. It attracts fish. Like there's calls for deer, there's calls for ducks, there's calls for everything. Fish call is sound-driven, uh, food-driven. Fish. The only way to to uh, attract the fish is to make it sound like food. Right. 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 It's not a mating thing. It's a food thing. And they're, what they're listening for is the sound the lobster makes. And so does all, I mean, largemouth bass are big on crayfish, right. right? And crayfish make the same kind of sound, and I've recorded that too. And now I'm putting that sound into bass jigs and drop shots. And, it, it, you know, it's, it's not all to try to make money. It's just what I like to do to catch fish. You know, it's not, it's, I never meant for all this to be a business, really. It's like, what came first, the chicken or the egg? Well, the rattlesnaker came first, and then the world record came along with it. And then after that, I had no choice. Right. I had to sell it. Right. People wanted it. And I never wanted to be on Shark Tank. I never tried to be on Shark Tank. That happened because all these show promoters were like, you got the world record striped bass, you got all these bass, we want you to bring your mounts to these shows, you can have a free booth, we'll pay you money. Great. What am I going to sell? Right, so all right, I'll, I'll maybe we can see how the rattlesinker goes, but I got to patent it at least first or try. Right. Having no money at the time, I went to the University of the Law School, a uh, University of Connecticut Law School, and they were like, "Yeah, we know who you are. We're fishermen." A guy named Dollenbach and some other guys there were like, "Put a student on it." They filed for a patent. I just happened to be directing traffic that day in Bridgeport, working for the DOT uh, as an electrician at a red light, <laughs> and I it was a freezing cold day i get a call from hollywood california on my cell phone i'm like it must be a you know spam or whatever i answer it while my buddy's at the light and they're like you know we're shark tank we you just filed a patent application and i guess they study they, they look for these applications to get filed and then they call you and ask you what your product is right so i'm like yeah i invented a fish call it works great and i caught a bunch of fish and blah 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 <laughs> And they're like, wow, that sounds interesting. You know, if we're interested more, we'll see. You know, by the time I got home from work, I had messages from the producers of the show. And after talking to them for a while and making them laugh and, and joking around with them on the phone, they, I flew out. The next thing you know, I was flying to Hollywood, California, and uh, walking into Shark Tank without any sales, without any packaging, barely with a business, you know, just an idea. And uh, 
And Mark Cuban, I could tell, you know, like I, I walked in, I could tell right away he wanted it. He, he for some reason, he was, uh, he loved me. And uh, there it goes. Yeah. You know, it just, uh, the thing took on a mind of its own. And really, all I wanted to do was catch more striped bass and more fish. And if something works and works well, there's no stopping it. Right, right. Even if you tried to, like, I don't promote this business, really. I don't, I don't, it's not my thing. I'm a fisherman. You know, I'm not a businessman. I told Mark Cuban that. I said, I'm not a, he said, you're not a businessman. I said, you're right. I'm a fisherman. I said, it's not, he's like, well, I'll handle all that. But, you know, he had a company that was in the fishing business and they really didn't want to get involved with making it. So, you know, it's not a lot to it, but they were onto a different product. It was a shotgun shell bobber thing or whatever. And they, you know, that was their, so he dumped it on me. He's like, you know, you, you got to do it. So I've been like, all right, I've been, I've been running it half ass as best I can. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And it sells. It's got a mind of its own now. And <clears throat> I'd rather be in the woods, man, you know? Uh, I mm -hmm. get up every morning, I tie a fly. I go down to the river in my old Willie's Jeep, and I test it out. Right. You know, that's what I want to do. Right. Go up in my tree stand, watch deer walk by, bears, watch the owls, you know. I don't want to run around trying to promote some fishing product. No. Right. But. Pays the bills. Keeps the tank full on the boat. Yeah, you know, it, it, it does. <laughs> it's, it's not a bad way to go. Yeah. So stepping back. Sure. You're back, back deep into the fishing. Right. You, like like me and maybe a lot of other folks, look at, uh, you know, the, the, the fish, these moon phases. Right. And I, I read in your book. Right now we're in a 99.8% full moon. Stay home. Ain't worth going. <laughs> it's not Tide's worth, too rough. Right. Tide's too fast. The best moon is a first quarter moon that rises at noon and is dead high in the sky at sunset, creating a perfect backdrop with a slower tide because it's a quarter moon, right? So the fish not only use it to see their prey above them because it's dead high in the sky at sunset. If you could, if you could go through, what, what I like to do to find the best fishing days of the year is to use apps like iMoonU or uh, tide app. Mm -hmm. So then I go through and I find that first quarter moon and does it line up with a, f a slack high tide at sunset? If you could find that slack high tide at sunset on a first quarter moon, you, you drop everything you have to do and you be out and fish. If you're going to fish one day a year, that's the day you want to be fishing. And that's only happening a few times of the year. Anyway. It may not even happen. Right. I mean, it, right. it may be a cloudy day. Right. It may, you know, it, but that's, if you could get that perfect no wind, uh, first quarter moon, slack high tide, sunset anywhere from June till October. That's it. You're on. It's That's game good. on. It's game yeah. on. You're not going to find a better condition. That's interesting because, I mean, these bass, they're feeding. And they're feeding every day. Oh, yeah. So the question I have is, on that full moon, I mean, I don't bother going fishing for bass on a full moon. I right. know I'm not going to get anything. Right. But they've got to be feeding at some point in the tide. Oh, yeah. So they're in the slack tide feeding yeah. or, uh, you know, it's just not a pronounced period of activity. I don't know that they're not feeding through the whole tide, but when you're doing six knots on a drift and you need 16 ounces of lead to even hold bottom. Right. Who the hell wants a fish in that? Right. And usually <clears throat> I've caught more big striped bass than anybody in the world. And I, I don't care who, who, who says they've caught bigger. They haven't. I've got 82s. I've got I've got a fish that's over 100 pounds I released. Right. I've got 70s and 60s and 50s. I've never caught one of those fish over 1.4 knots of tide. Right. right. Not one. Interesting. Other key points. Other, you know, the, the moon phase, the tide, the weather, all of that aside. When you're, when you're fishing, what's your rig look like? Uh, Start with a rod. It, yeah, I mean, like, I used to talk to uh, Dick Posey from Lamb of Glass, and I wound mm -hmm. up designing rods for him because he <laughs> – I used to go through yard sales and look at rods that people were throwing out, and I'd say, all right, there's a decent stick. I'd take it. I'd modify it. I'd cut it back. I'd put a roller tip on because I like braid. Excuse me. Braid will always cut through the eye tip on the end. Mm -hmm. Not any of the rest of the eyes, but it'll cut that eye tip. If you have a regular eye on the end, it'll cut right through that. It'll you know, you'll have to always replace that. So what I like to do is I always had a roller tip mm -hmm. 
I, I've switched it from rod to rod to rod, you know what I mean? And when I find a better stick, I pull that roller tip off and I pop it on, <laughs> I pop it on the next, what's going to be the next one, you know? And, and uh, Dick Posey from Lamb Glass is like, hey, man, I see you, uh, you know, I want you to design rods for me. And for a brief time, I did, and his son took over. And, you know, I'm still working with them slightly, but it's different now. Mm -hmm. But um, I like the rod that I like and the one that I designed for them. Uh, has a long a long cork handle, uh -huh. which used to be when when Dick Posey gave it to me, he's like, "What would you change about this rod?" It's the Triflex series, and I made the I said, "Get rid of the foam, get go back to cork, make it thicker, because when you're holding a rod all night long, your hands will cramp up with a thin handle. You want it thicker, a lightweight rod. It's about seven. I got a seven foot six inch and a seven foot two inch." Um, nine eyelet, extra eyelets, one roller tip on the end, extended the handle so when you get that big fish, you can put it under your armpit and, and use it for the, the, you know, you know, I used to have bruises on my gut from right. digging handles into my stomach trying to fight big fish. Nah, I want it, you know, so that rod is, and you talk to great fishermen, striped bass fishermen, especially like Joe DiOrio. Right. That's what they use, man. They, those are, that, that rod, and, and, and you don't really know it until you've fished for a certain length of time and have caught a certain amount of bass that this is an asset to the to the trip. You're, you're not cramped up. You could use light reels and it's a light rod and it's got the, I caught a freaking 11 foot shark with one the other night. Right. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yep. And I won. I, I battled that thing forever in Montauk and I, I landed it. Yep. You know? Yep. Um, it's got backbone. You could pick a cinder block up with it. You know? But I've fished with a lot of junk my whole life too, and 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 especially fly fishing. Like you know, I, I I started fly fishing at a really early age, and I had a, a game fisher fly rod that was up from Wilco. It was a piece of junk, but I I'm so glad that I worked my way up, and was never fortunate enough to buy myself a Hardy when I was uh, 18 years old. You know, I, I got a Hardy last year, a nine foot three weight, and. Like, I fly fished all over the country. I, I go to the San Juan. I fish the Gunnison and the, the Roach River in Maine and the Roaring Fork and Frying Pan. I mean, you name it, I've been there. The Green River. I fished them all. And I finally uh, have just been able to afford myself a hardy reel and rod. And, that, and uh, it's like a dream, you know? And I'm so glad that I started with crap. Right. Because I would have never appreciated it, you know? Yep. So you go from what? What are you putting on reel on that rod? Anything in particular? On the uh, the, the on your bass rod. The bass rod. <sighs> we have all kinds of. I mean, I. There's nothing in particular there, that really. You know, there's nothing that. I have so many different reels I try out. Um, I like star drags that I could identify the tightening process with a click. Right. That way, I don't over tighten during the battle, you know, and snap it off. And when you catch big stripers, a lot of times that's the, you know, you're, like, boat fishing is totally different than, mm -hmm. you know, I've caught some of my biggest striped bass from the rocks at Jamestown and Beavertail. On a, on a Halloween night, I caught a 70-pound bass on an Atlas popper. Nice. You know, uh, when I was at URI. And uh, getting that fishing was lucky. You know, you don't pull a fish in that big from shore it's just a, it's a lot harder you, if you're in a boat you can run them down you can follow them down and right. you know but the drag system i like it to be a clicking one so that i don't over tighten in the fight you know i, I I'm, I'm leaning towards the smaller reels now the mm -hmm. lighter ones you know i used to fish with the old pen and i love it i have a pen tattooed reel on my shoulder <laughs> you know but i like the the newer lighter right. uh the newer stuff there's a lot of great tackle out there now. It's a, I, mean, oh. it, I look at the progression yeah. from when first time I ever fly fished in salt water outside of you know bonefish in Tarbonetta, Florida. Right up here was with a cherrywood rod, mm -hmm. <clears throat> a reel that just had no business on salt water, <laughs> yeah. and he went out there thrashing mm -hmm. away at bluefish yep. and 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 bass and getting them and busting stuff. Trial and, and error. And just you know whatever it yeah. took, get yeah. there, and then what happened? A river runs through it. Oh my God! One of that my movie favorites. came out. One of my favorites. Absolutely, but the tackle boom that occurred, yep. the equipment, 
the quality of gear that it was just an incredible boom after that. Well, wait till the movie comes out, Born to Fish. It's going to happen is. again. There's another one. Because that <laughs> that book is going to be a movie, and I got people trying to buy the movie rights right now. Yeah, well, it'll be fun. I, don't know. I said, uh, they said, who's going to play? I said, Brad Pitt. Yeah, of course. Of course. Who's going to play? Right. Who's as close to as good looking as me? <laughs> I've got some ideas, but we're not going to go there. I'm not. Uh, I'm kidding. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, kind of. So anyway, you're, <laughs> so from real to, to, to your leader, how do you set up? Your braid all the time. Yeah, I, mean, if, I like the three-way. Uh, you know, 50-pound yep. Cortland braid I use. Greenish color in the water, blends in. Um, it depends on how clear the water is, too. Sure. The more east I go, the clearer the water gets and the thinner the braid gets. I'll go down to 30 pounds and block. Right. Uh, and, and drop the three-way swivel and, and tie it up with a little, uh, you know, go right from the braid to the, to the, to the leader and even a 30-pound leader. Even right. though the fish are bigger out that way, mostly, right. um, the water's clear. So the more crap you got on there, you know, you're just... They're going to see it. Right. And they're going to spook. We've right. noticed that this year in particular out uh, front of uh, Newport and Brenton Reef, yep. Seal Ledge, all right. that. Yep. You just can't run anything but... Crystal clean water out there. Yeah, no, and huge fish, tons of huge fish. Yeah. And you just can't do anything with it. Right. Uh, it, it if you've got a bunch of terminal tackle hanging off of there. Right. So, um, yeah. So now you're into your rig. You're, you're top shotting? Uh, usually I put uh, the, the uh, rattle sinker right on the three-way okay. in the sound area and up to, out to Montauk. In Block Island, I make a little dropper off the right. braid. Right. And uh, I'll, you could use a lot less weight out there. Um, I, a lot of times now, I like to just flip a flip an eel out on Southwest Ledge without weight at all. Sure. Or a one-ounce weight. Yep. So just to sink that eel a little bit and make that clicking sound in there. Right. And, and call out that eel that's, you know, and it's deadly. Yeah. You know. Um, there is a one particular way I do it I do it as whatever it takes to catch them yep. you know you have yep. to be able to switch up quick you know you can't uh, can't just rely on one way to, to do it yep. you know? absolutely fishing all circle hooks with your eels I, I, I'd rather use a conventional hook uh -huh. a 5-0 or a 6-0 conventional hook with the eel right um, just because I love to set the hook right you know <laughs> And especially, you know, if you're three-way in eels, they there's a real subtle take. Sometimes you, you I mean, you, having the braid and having a sensitive rod and and being completely in tune with the drift and walking that sinker, it's rattling. Your I, I have a technique I invented called rattling. Mm -hmm. So when I I have the rod pointed down and I'm reaching for bottom, as soon as I feel it, I reel up a little bit. I keep reaching, but as you're reaching, you're clicking. Your sinker's clicking. You're hitting bottom. You're stirring up some stuff. The the fish are, they're getting in line for that. Right. They're like, here comes a lobster. He's coming down. I can feel the sand hitting me in the face. He's gonna be here any second. Oh, oh well, there's an eel. Well, I'll eat him. Sure. <laughs> I'm there. not gonna pass it up. Right. I'm an right. opportunistic right. feeder. Boom. Right. So this is, the latest version. That's the latest version of the rattle sinker. Uh, I made it look like a grenade. Mm-hmm. Um. And that was by accident as well. It, I was fooling with a Dremel tool to have my sinker get through the water better, right? So I could use a lighter weight in a faster tie. Right. And it worked. But what, the, what it came out looking like every time was a grenade. <laughs> so I'm like, you know, well, I see people online catching, using the rattle sinker and catching all these fish and it looks like a regular weight. I'm like, this thing should have a more distinctive look, so I know it's a rattle sinker when I, you know, right. and there's no mistaking it now. No. Nope. You know? Nope. I mean, the old one works great. The old, you know, the old uh, bang sinker. Right. But uh, now there's no mistake in it. So I'll show you what it's so. So, like, as I'm drifting, I'm walking this way. And you hear that? Yep. It's making that click. Absolutely. As you're, and as sound travels 100 times faster underwater, especially in salt water, than it does in fresh because of the molecules in the water. It's denser. Right? It bounces off. The sound travels faster on the molecules. You don't want your sound to be overbearing. You know, people make poppers and all this stuff with this big ball in there. Like, it yeah. doesn't sound like anything a fish would eat. Right? right? You, you'll catch, 
you'll catch fish with it. Maybe not huge ones that are smarter than that. I want to be on the bottom, walking along with that. You know, does it sound exactly like a lobster? No, but it's making the same decibel range. And striped bass don't know that. Like right. they, they hear it, it's, that's, could it be, right? right? They're gonna go check it out. Well, once I hear it, you've got their attention. Right. And they're gonna come around, right. particularly in a still night. Right. In a, in a slow tide. They hear, they hear a lot better than people give them credit. Oh, sure. That's why I fish stealth. When I'm, when I'm big bassing, I'm stealth mode, man. I got no shoes on. I'm, I'm, I don't let anyone talk if they're with me. I'd rather fish alone. Uh, I got my spots marked. I know where there's big boulders, current breaks for big lazy bass that get behind them. They don't want to expend any energy. Usually there's lobster pots nearby. They're down there. They're sitting behind that rock and they're listening for that clicking sound. And when they hear it, they come out, they eat it, and they go back and they sit yeah. there. Yeah. And that spot and other spots like that, I have marked on my GPS and, and I have it marked for a west wind, for a, for a south wind, for a, you know, because I want to get there and you only have one shot at it usually. You can't fool a big bass twice if you don't hit it on the first trip. Right. You know what I mean? If, if you get that fish and it feels a hook and you didn't get it, you're not going to get it again. Maybe another day. But so I have those drifts set up perfect. So when I get over that spot, I don't blow it on the first try. Engines off. Knots are, knots are new. Leaders cut off. Hooks right. are sharp. Right. You know, there's no mistake for error. The, we're out there having fun. The fish is fighting for its life, right? <laughs> so it's, you know, the, you don't want to give it any weakness in your game. You got to have all the, uh, everything stacked in your favor because, you know, an 82-pound striper is only going to come around maybe once in your lifetime. Most people are not. Right. Right? So you, you don't want to sit there at the bar saying, oh, I had the biggest fish in my Oh, yeah, you're full of shit. <laughs> no, really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? <laughs> yep. Yep. That's just another fish story. Right. Right. Sure. No. I like my fish stories to be like, hey, look at that one on the wall. Let me tell you how I caught that one. <laughs> That's right. And here's the video or the photos. Mm. And, right. Yeah. Here's the world record certificate next to it. To, right. To prove it. And that pretty much covers it right there. Okay. What are you so it's me? interesting what's happening now, and and you know I I, I read in your book yep. one of the things that you really focused on, and a lot of us are, is just releasing these fish. Yeah. Catch and release, yeah. and that's that's. I mean, it's really taken hold, and it, within my lifetime, it's become reality. When I first started fishing, that just didn't exist. Right. Uh, I mean, I remember going to Florida and seeing rows of tarpon hung up. Right. And you know, which nobody ate. Yep. They were they were there for the photograph to yeah. send home. I mean, uh, you know, we've we've we. It's kind of tough in some industries. The charter industry, it's very difficult for those guys. Right. Because people again, love their fish. Yep, yeah, people love the fish. Yeah. People love to catch big fish. But people even want to prove what they caught. Like, look what I caught. Right. And, and nothing happens with it. Right. You know, they bring it home and it rots in the garden, or they throw it in the woods, a raccoon. Why? You know, I, I was there. You know, when I was a kid, I used to tote fifty-pound bass around my neighborhood in a wagon. Right. Just to show them what I caught. Right. You know what I mean? It, it's a look what I got. Right. You know what I mean? But that's not cool anymore, man. You know what I mean? You're going to wipe these things out. Right. You know? So I probably made a lot of enemies. In the beginning, I was in the big tournaments. Right. And, and I just started noticing all these big fish dead. And nothing was going to happen with them. And these are the, you know, they're, they're the breeders, you know? And, and we're wiping them out for what? Bragging rights. Yeah. Right. right? You know? I probably wouldn't even have kept the world record striped bass if I wasn't in a kill tournament. Right. You know? You know, and, and I started promoting the catch and release tournaments. And I, I'm actually a consultant for people that are having tournaments like that. You know, I've worked with bunches, a bunch of organizations for their tournaments. They call me. They're like, how are we going to do this? And I tell them, look, this is how it's going to go. You know, you, you have a tape measure. Everybody sends an email in what, the, what they're what the biggest fish is at the time. The picture of the... You don't have to measure one if you don't even think it's close. You don't even have to take it out of the water. You let it go, right? Yep. You take the picture. You show the measurement. You release the fish. Perfect. That's it. Right. Right. But, you know, a lot of the, the big tournaments, you know, they, they, they're like... It, it financially, it hurt them, you know? 
there's a lot of money in hanging fish. Right. I mean, I, I'm primarily an uh, offshore fisherman. Right. I, I fish inshore quite a bit, but my focus is tournament fishing, uh, blue marlin, uh, or billfish generally. And, and, you know, we've had a couple of really big fish on. And, you know, fortunately, I never got to the point of making a judgment because the hook came back empty. Right. And, but we fought some really, really big fish out there. Like and, the old man in the sea. Yeah, that's right, right? You almost looked like, what was that guy? Santiago, right? Was that his name? You're like Except Santiago. for the accent. I'm there. There we go. There we go. Yeah, no, I, I get it, man. You know, I, I've, I've, I've lived in Florida and, and uh, used to do a lot of bill fishing there. Sure. Yeah, I, I fished out of the Keys. Uh, my uncle owned a textile business out of Miami. Uh, dolphin textile. We used to fish all kinds of tournaments down there. Out of uh, I don't know one of the keys. I can't even remember what. Or nah. Yeah. Um, Ocean Reef. Okay, sure. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I love the keys. But and most of those tournaments have gone over to release. Yeah. They're not hanging fish anymore. Yeah. The big big tournaments. Let's say you know the, the Mid Atlantic. Yeah. The, the Big Shoot Rock. Out. Yeah. Right, you know, the, the, the yeah, the tri-state, the, the, the shootout, yeah. they're still hanging big fish. Yeah. And when you get down there in the Big Rock, which we fish every year, and you, you know, there's hundreds, if not thousands of people gathered at the way station. Yeah, that's part of the game. They want to see the fish. To see a <laughs> 400 plus pound fish get pulled up on the scale yep. and weighed in. This year, Mike Jordan caught a 400 pound, some odd pound fish. We try to tape them in the water so we know roughly, are we going to be in the top three? Right. If we're not in the top three, that fish goes away. Right. That's it. Yeah, we'll that's move on. good conservation. That's as, as it should be. Right. But, but to my thinking, when a big fish comes up on your bait and you're trolling, it happens to be a big fish. For you to land and release three or four fish in a day, that's an accomplishment. Right. Now... To catch that big fish, you have to do everything perfect because that fish has seen so much in its life. Yep. But nonetheless, to me, for, for the, the release category is what really shows significant skill. Yeah. Is because you've been able to catch so many of these fish. There's, yeah. two, there's 200 boats in, the, in, 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 in a big rock. Yeah, the IGFA has a release category now. Yep. I help promote. Uh, and that's, that's where I was going with this. Right. Because I really want to understand how does that release category work? I, for one, have never heard of it. Right. And I, and I read it in your book, and it's something that really needs to be made known yeah. uh, uh, so, so that folks can participate in this. Yeah, so so the IGFA has, uh, they asked me to promote it, and I did. I had the first uh, or second world record catch and release all tackle length records. You know, yep. it got broke by a buddy of mine, Frank Crescitelli from Staten Island. Yep. Um, and then recently broke again in Virginia. And... You can't get the all tackle record now anyway because they're not letting you take fish that are that big, you know. So it's um, another great subject we're going to get into. Yeah. But uh, so you know, the IGFA supplies you have to use their me their tape measurement, which is fifty dollar me tape measure. You uh, you get the fish out of the water. You take pictures of it on the measuring thing, the tape laid out perfect. It shows the measurement of the fish. You take a quick girth. Sh take a picture of the release. Show the fish swimming off, and that's and it. And that's it. Right. And then you submit that to the IGFA, and Jack Vitek, the records coordinator there, will either approve it or reject, reject it, yep. and uh, get yourself a world record. See, that's exceptional. I mean, that's a, that's a whole new game. Yeah. It, it opens up so much. Yeah. And and, and and they have it for everything now. And it does, and it takes a little bit of pressure off because I can imagine there's some level of pressure on regulators yeah. when. You know, the, the, the length limits, the slot limits, and it's not just striped bass. It's a lot of fish. It all comes down to politics, man. Well, it's politics, but it's also fisheries. <laughs> yeah. Unfortunately, you know, unfortunately, I think... Unfortunately, everything does, right? right? You know what I mean? It's uh, uh, There's a number on it, and someone's getting that number. It's not us. Right. Right? We're getting the shaft, but it's, you know, it, it all comes down to money. Right. So you, you know? look at... You look at whether it's ICAT or, you know, Atlantic, you know, the National Marine Fishery Service, it's all based on science, right. um, most of which I can't argue with because I'm not a scientist. But, right. but, and, and then you look at how those boards are made up and the impact of that, you know, in the decision making. So, uh, you know, it, as you say, it's politics and some of it's just not good politics. 
the economics of, of fishing uh, are nowhere near what they used to be for commercial guys with the fleet in Gloucester being essentially closed up. Right. It, it, it just no longer viable. Um, but you now with the economics of recreational fishing overtaking the, the commercial, right. it's, it's going to be a different day, and I think we're starting to see that. You advocate in, in your book for a slot limit. I found that very interesting. Because immediately following your book's publication, there was a slot limit. Yeah. So now we're 28 to 35 on striped bass. Right. <clears throat> I, I almost went and worked for the Atlantic States. Right. They asked yeah. me to be on the... Um, for some reason, I didn't want to sit there arguing over right. slot limits and fish. And you know, They call me. They ask me. I, I'll tell them what I think. Right. You know, but I, I, I don't... You know, it's not my thing right now. Right. Maybe, maybe down the road. You know, I'm not going to be bought. You ain't buying me, right? right? right, right. <laughs> maybe that's part of the problem, you right. know. But uh, I'll just tell it like it is from what I see. And conservation is going to always come down to the fishermen. Right. It's not going to ever be what some politician or some whatever wants and whoever DP thing, you know, they could, they could you know, they could work. Uh, trying to protect it, but it comes down to the person catching the fish. What are they going to do with it? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You, know, you got to, if you love the sport, if you love fishing, um, you're going to do the right thing. Right. If you're in it for the money and you just want to sell fish, right. then, you know, it's, then it's a different story. There's a fine balance we have to strike. And, I, and, and you know, f f the commercial fisheries, I've been, I've been involved with them for decades. Yeah. And, you know, I worked on lobster boats. We caught plenty of tuna on those boats. We stuck giants. We, you know, we <sighs> stuck sword, uh, you know, and all that. I get it. It's just that, but the gear's different. Yeah. I mean, we're not putting out 60 miles of line. Right. We're not pulling a ground net and tearing up habitat as well as fish. Right. You know, uh, it, it's a fairly selective fishery. And if fisher, if, if, you know, in catch and release, it works well if you manage that fish really, really well. And don't, you know, the light tackle fishing, I enjoy it, but those are fish I'm going to kill. Right. Because if you're fishing light tackle, a fish isn't going to make it. You spend two hours on a fish, that's it. You're not going to... You're well, the, the problem is, you know, people pull the fish out of the water, they want to show it off, and then they want to release it, but that's not going to work. Right. You lift that fish up, and you've done damage, <laughs> internal yeah. organs. Well, the fish has an air, a fish has an air bladder, mm -hmm. right? And that keeps it from floating to the surface, right? So if a fish comes out of the water, that air bladder, that swim bladder fills with air, right? Right. So the fish may be very well alive and when you let it go, it swims away, but that air bladder stays full of air, right? Right. So it, it floats back up and it becomes shark bait, right? or worse. Right. <laughs> but uh, you have to release fish on the bottom. Or it's the best way to release them if you can get them there. And, and uh, you know, I, I made a tool for that. Right. Uh, the deep, the deep uh, water release tool is a two pound piece of lead with a, a clip on it. So you, you clip it onto the fish and I have footage of it. Lower the fish down, it depressurizes. That air pumps out of the mouth. All of a sudden, a big bubble comes out of that fish. Then you just pull the thing off and the fish swims away. You just take it yeah. on your fishing rod, give it a no, jerk. You, it's, you just, I, I keep one in the corner of the boat on a uh, like kite, or laying a little thicker than kite string, right? You know, I put it on the bass after I do what I, you know, what I'm gonna do with it, take a picture or just release it. Right. I put it on. I lower it down to the bottom and pull it off. So is that principally for fish that you're catching deep, or I mean, if you're popping on the surface, it's you for any be fish okay. that I pull out of the water. Got it. Right. You know what I mean? Once a lot of times I don't even pull them out of the water anymore, uh, but if I do, right. and I got to get the hook out or whatever. Um, I'll put it on the release tool, drop it down, pull it off. You know, if you're fishing from the beach and you're in the water, you're usually not going to be taking the fish out of the water much anyway. Right. If you're a surf caster, you know, which I am. I surf cast all over the place. I love surf casting, right. you know. I'm not just a boat guy. Boat fish don't count, by the way. <laughs> they do so on I've my heard, boat. So <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know. The fish has got to be kept in the water for as long as possible right. and, and released 
released on the bottom if you're on a boat right. or at least 30, 30 feet of depth to depressurize it and get the air out. Right. Well, there's a lot of technology out there. This is the first technology I've seen for that kind of release. Yeah. There's degassing tools, which is you stab you through stab, the fish. That, that does the fish more harm, I think. And I was never really sold on yeah, that technology. Yeah, yeah. But, but uh, anything it, we can do to get those fish down and, and, and keep them healthy is where we need to just, be. Just depressurize them. Yeah, just drop yeah. them down and pull them off. You and I are both old enough. We went through, you know, you know, go back to the early 80s, late 70s for that matter. I don't remember the 80s yeah. real well. Yeah, right. Was at That's URI. We were at URI, weren't yeah, we? Yeah. How do we remember anyway? So they had, I mean, there really <laughs> were no bass. We didn't have any bass. No, I know. I mean, it was yeah. every once in a while you'd see a picture in the Fisherman magazine or, yeah. and, and there was some guy with a striped bass, not terribly big most often. And I would sit and listen to my, my grandfather and my uncle talk about <clears throat> the years with Niantic Bay spinners and just stacking them like cord with them. Yeah. I mean, they caught bass like crazy. Then we get, into the 80s, late 80s, we start seeing more regulation. Uh, they, they just begin the process of regulating bass. Right. Uh, and I don't remember exactly here, and I can remember sometime in the 80s with Steve O'Connell and my brother fishing out in Newport. <clears throat> We're just catching bluefish, and he hooks into something we thought was the bottom. Right. Fights it forever. I think 35 pound bass, something like that. The first real striper that we'd ever caught. Yeah. And that was it for us. I mean, it was, and from that point forward, we saw a real boom in bass numbers, right. and it continued, and it went right up and through. I'm going to say the 2004, five, six, and it. I don't know if that was the peak, but it was near the peak, and then boom, boom. it dropped, dropped right off. off. Yeah. It just crashed. Yeah, that can't all be the regulation. There's got to be. Well, uh, you know, the ecosystem is affected. Everybody wanted to be a striper fisherman too in the late in two thousand, you right. know, in two thousand ten, two thousand eleven. Man, I, I, everybody wanted to do it. I don't know why. I, was, I saw more people that wanted to striper fish than anybody. Right. And it just so here we are. We're on the decline. We're seeing new regulations coming in. I hear a good bit of griping about those regulations, not the least of which is that nobody can break your record now because if they get the 84-pound bass, they can't they can't keep it. The I hope someone breaks the record. Yeah. You know why? Yeah. Because if they do, it's only going to mean that the fishery has gotten that much better. There you go. Right? Exactly. And, and that's the most important thing. Right. Like, who cares about a fish you already caught? Right? Right. right, right. The best fish is the next fish. Right. Okay? <laughs> I don't care. I'd rather catch a two-pounder tomorrow then never have caught another fish again and say I caught one that was 82 pounds. Right. Well, sure. Well, what sure. good is it? So what do you think about the regulations? Do you think this is working? Is this where we need to go? Do we yeah. need more regulation? If you, if, you were, if you were completely in charge of striper regulations along the eastern seaboard, what would be your next move? Or do you think we're doing what we should be doing? I think what we're doing is good. I think there's a lot of grandfathered in people that are murdering fish that they're... Look at, I'm going to steal a line from the godfather. I don't care how someone makes their living, as long as it doesn't interfere with the way I make my living. Right, <laughs> right, right. But these guys have made a living catching fish, and, and that's all they know. That's what they do. So they grandfather them in or whatever to kill so many fish they're allowed to, right? Is it right? I don't know, right? But I wouldn't. I wouldn't allow that. Makes perfect sense. I mean, I look back at. I mean, you as got, you, you point out in your book, you go back mm -hmm. not that long ago. You know, it's a hundred years, yeah. but we used to market hunt ducks, yeah. and it was completely unregulated until you know a lot of those species get dwindled to the point where they just weren't available. Right. And then yeah. it, it got. Oh, let's do something about it. Right. I don't see a wood duck. Right. Yeah. Right? And now That's we're not at, the right time, right? Uh, and now and now we've got, you know, the, the limits that we have and yeah. they're up and they're down and they yeah. exchange. Conservation is, you know, it's it's the way to go, but it's it's gotta be the sportsman's job to do it. Right. Right. And that's just that's not just releasing fish. That's you know, not flipping your cigarette butt in the water or letting that garbage fly off the back of the boat or the can of water, you know, soda, the plastic yeah, bottle. It, it gets kind of discouraging when, when a nuclear power plant in Japan dumps all their crap into the water while we're over here trying to, you know, right. clean things up. And now we got this wall of, it's, a, it's you know, the, the world's fucked up. Right. It, there's all kinds of crazy shit going on. Right. 
you know, it's it's discouraging. But you can't, you know, it's got to come down to regulation of epic proportions. Or each individual has got to take responsibility for something beyond the impact of them. They've yeah. got to look at the impact of the entire fishery or, 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 or to, to the, let's call it the planet, you yeah. know, and think about their kids. Yeah. And, you know, when you go out, uh, you know, for, for a number of years, we'd be out fishing uh, offshore in the Gulf Stream. And I was amazed at how clean it had become, how little floating debris was out there. Right. And now I'm seeing that turn around. And yeah. now we're seeing a lot more. Shit everywhere. And I don't know exactly what, what, what what's happening, but it's, it's individual responsibility. When I see a charter get, captain who will go on name, flip a, flip a soda bottle over his shoulder. Yeah, I, that's bad. That just blows my mind. Right. I can't co- comprehend right. that. It, 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 it's, that's your livelihood out right. there. Right. I saw a guy the other day picking up balloons on the water. Yeah. He had yeah. about five or ten. I don't know how many he had piled up in there. I said, I pulled up to him. I said, man, thanks. Yep. You know, because yep. they're floating there and people don't realize what they're doing. Right. You know, you let go of your balloon, it's going to wind up in the ocean. Absolutely. Everything's going to wind up in the ocean. Yep. Anything that floats out, it's going down. And they have the, the uh, what are they, the nylon, not the nylon, the uh, the metal fabric balloons. I can't remember what they're called. Yeah, yeah. But uh, those things are just everywhere out there because yeah. they just don't break down. It's right. not like, I mean, we use, you know, natural rubber balloons when we shark fish or tuna fish because they're biodegradable. And it's not going to sink. I mean, it's it's the easiest thing in the world to do. It's tough to know what the right thing is to do. You know, it's everybody wants to do the right thing. Um, it's just everybody's bouncing on. Like, like even you and I right now, we're bouncing ideas all around. Right. Like we're talking about what should happen and like what we wish would happen, and we care, right? And so mm-hmm. does everybody else. Mm-hmm. I don't know. Yep. Is it going to take one super smart person to know what the hell to do? I it's going to take every individual person. <laughs> right. That's what it's going to come down to. Right. And I think you're the best right. thing we can do is live by example yeah. and hope that people pick up on that and understand it. I think what you've been doing, uh, you're, you're, I'll call it a transition to pure release fishing, yeah. uh, is pretty exceptional. I mean, you've got a fish estimated 106-pound striped bass yeah. that you released. Yeah. Which is an exceptional, I mean, it's a remarkable thing. It's, it's a decision, you, you know, very few will face. It, I just couldn't justify keeping that fish. Like, after I caught the world record striped bass, I, uh, you know, I'm looking at the fish and I'm like, you know, this thing must have lived for, and then they, they took a scale sample. It was a 30-year-old fish almost, yep. you know. Yep. It's been through red tides, nor'easters, hurricanes, escaped trawler boats, shark attacks, it, it, it's made it, it broke people's lines and had broken hooks in it, and then I wiped it out. Right. right. You know, at that point, I, I thought about it and I was like, you know, I wasn't cool with it. And I was going to, I was, I felt bad, actually, with what happened. So I, I just decided to let the fish speak. And it's not me, it's the fish. I'm using the fish now. As a, you know, people people sometimes want to hear what I have to say. All right, well, mm-hmm. it's because of the fish. They don't care about me, mm-hmm. right? So the fish, by dying, I'm trying to use that to save more fish. Sure. You know, that's all I can do to make myself feel somewhat better about what I did. Right. You know. Well, you didn't do anything. Ninety nine point nine percent of the world wouldn't have done. Right? Yeah, you know, but ninety nine percent of the world would feel a different way about it. Everybody's going to feel different sure. about it. You sure. Know? You know, sure. like I don't even want to see that fish half the time. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. I, you know, I just see it and I'm like, yeah, what, what did I do? Yeah. You know, I got a piece of paper. <clears throat> I killed it for a piece of paper and to make somebody richer in a, that it was running a fisher, fishing tournament. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Eh, you know, it's, uh, I'm moving into a different area. You know, and, and it's, it's not, kill right. fish tournaments anymore that's, that's for sure and I think we're going to see a lot of growth in the no kill tournaments I mean it's 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 a necessity it's going to come we're going to have yeah. and we're going to have opportunities oh it already right. is moving the IGFA into a release 
record is is just a spectacular move on their on their yeah. part. Uh, you know, yeah. and, there, and there's just so much that can be done with it. Yeah, it's a great organization. Yep, yep. And we're gonna. I just uh, more information on that. We're gonna make sure we get that out there and post wherever we can, um, and 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 try to really promote that. Good. Because I'm sure that there are at least a handful of empty categories. Oh yeah, and, and there's I'll, a lot of them that are easily broken. Sure. And you can get a world record. Yep. Get it. Absolutely. I think it would be a ball. And, and you're and you're not going to hurt anything doing it. No. Maybe your wallet a little bit. Yeah, but, uh, but you're yeah. going to do that anyway. Right. Exactly. <laughs> right. There it is. I'm right. kidding. <clears throat> so if new new bass fishermen just getting going, yep. starting up tomorrow. Yeah. Never been there, never done it. Yep. Well, I'm gonna, I would say if you don't know how to tie a knot, <laughs> tie a lot of them. <laughs> <laughs> no, look, I didn't know. Yep. You know, like, you just... Either you got it, you love it, or or you don't. Right. You know what I mean? Right. Yeah. And uh, I've seen little kids, man, they love it. Yep. And they're gonna be great fishermen. They're gonna fish their whole life. Yep. They gotta be introduced to it. You gotta, you know, most kids, are, they're on their phone, they're they're pale white, they don't get any sunlight. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, what the hell's going on? You know, the, it's just so crazy. Technology is killing everyone. Yep. It is. Yep. Um, but I would say, if if you if, there, if you know a kid, take him fishing. Right. Take him fishing. Maybe he loves it. That's the only way. Like I would have never known. I mean, I, you know, I mean, I, I maybe I would have because I actually fished in the sewer in front of my house and no one I knew fished, mm -hmm. and I would just dipped that plastic fish in the sewer, and that was kind of natural to me, you know. Um. You picked it up somewhere. Somewhere along the yeah, way. So, you, you saw know, someone fishing. Right. You saw it. I, I give away fishing rods. Like, I've, you know, in the position I am, I've had so many people giving me fishing rods and reels and companies give me lures. And mm. I have piles of fishing stuff that I'm never going to use. And I give it away to kids. Sure. All the time. Yep. I'm like, here, man, here's a new rod. Look at, you know, just whatever. Yep. There's a lot of great turn. You know, the, the Fort Wetherill Boaters Association in Jamestown ran for years and years and years a kids fishing tournament. And we had kids come in mostly from northern Rhode Island, yep. inner city. Yep. And you'd take them on the boats. I remember running uh, my boat, my uncle's boat. You take the, you know, and you'd have all these kids come down. And they're a little bit frightened when they got down there and weren't, wasn't quite sure. Yeah. Changed their life. But to a person, every one of those kids, when that rod started oh, bouncing, yeah, was that was it. That was it. It's, it's game on. And man. for some, it'll change their lives. It will. And they'll run with it and, and you know. Hey, you never know what you're going to reel in. Right. You know what I mean? Yep. Yep. And it, it, it could it, change your life. One cast. <laughs> and it, pro it provides, yeah. it, 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 you know, <laughs> as it did for you, yep. it, it, I think it provides a place you can go to find solace. Yeah. I mean, fishing saved crazy, my life. In a crazy, crazy world. Right. So I'm going to take it back again to your young years yeah growing up yep yeah what time where uh, were you north haven north haven connecticut yep and your dad's in a unique industry i'll call it yeah you're you're you're, you're have a unique family situation yeah he, he would bring home the new cadillac every week and say look at this you could fit four bodies in the trunk <laughs> and it doesn't matter how comfortable they are <laughs> Oh yeah, that's great, Dad. So Dad was making books. Yeah, he was he was well known. Yeah. Yeah. Until yeah. the feds took him out. Yeah. Uh, right after the state championship football game, I played my senior year. The agents raided our house. Yeah. And my father was in one room. I was the we were the only two in the house. I had a machine gun up to my head. They threw me down on the shag carpet, and said, "Just shut the fuck up." And I just said, "Man, I'm not saying a word." They took my father, they threw him down on the shag carpet next to me. And my father, being a funny guy that he was, you know, he could see how terrified I was. We were face to face looking at each other. And he says, that's where Ollie took a shit this morning. Right where we were Ollie, your dog, right? <laughs> yeah. Dad's I, lightening up the moment. I, we huh? started laughing, and the FBI's like, what the fuck are you guys laughing at? <laughs> you know? But uh, now my father, he was a good guy. He had a good heart. He was a member of the Humane Society. He loved animals. He didn't agree with what I did all the time as a hunter and trapper. Uh, he actually offered me money to stop at times, you know. <laughs> right. 
But that's just the way I was, you know. Yep. So you go forward. You've, you're surrounded by interesting folks who are coming up from New York City, I think, principally. Yeah. And spending time at the house. And, right. You know, eventually Dad goes goes through his trial or, yeah. you know, his plea, yeah. and, and he, he ends up on probation and, 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 and then all He was of, sick. They didn't want to take him. He had Parkinson's, and that was the end of that. Yeah, they didn't yeah. want to deal with that in the right. system. Right. And uh, But you care, you know, obviously for many years after he had Parkinson's. Right. You you cared for him and yeah, over that tough. time. Yeah, it was tough. Those are tough years. Yeah. Yeah. And it's a horrible disease to watch. Um it got me wrapped up in all kinds of other shit. You know, I was doing drugs and drinking and all kinds of crap to try to numb the pain to it, you right. know? Wound up right. in some pretty bad situations. Um, but luckily I had fishing all along to right. keep me from totally going down the wrong path, you know? Right. I mean, I spent more time on the water fishing that I could think clearer and get out of those bad situations and get to where I am. Well, it seems that's where you always come back to right. throughout your life. Right. A lot of uh, interesting traumatic events. You know, you, the, the, your car wreck, you get sideswiped by someone who hasn't got a driver's license right, or right. working for an insurance company. and, and Yeah. The I latest mean, was a plane crash. Right. So, <laughs> what, what, so I'm working up to... <laughs> you know, you've gone through a lot of these things. Yeah. And, the, you know, most recently here in Connecticut, at Bradley Airport. Yep. Uh, well, it was a, a C-1. B, a B-17 bomber crashed uh, right in, into the job site I was working. It was a pretty horrific scene. Uh, caused, caused a lot of deaths and caused me to have all kinds of issues, uh, respiratory problems. And I did, did some lung damage. Uh we tried to help people. It was too hot. Watched them burn to death. It caused PTSD that I didn't even know existed. You know, and now I'm back to the fishing. And I, ha I had to get out in the woods. I just bought a house out in, in the woods in East Haddam. And I just... It's hampering relationships. Yeah. It's ha it's hindering a lot well, of things. I can't imagine. I you mean, know? To, to hear those folks and what, you know... To, yeah. Uh, yeah. It's just a... Uh, it this seems like shit happens to around me all the time. I'm like, what am I, a magnet to bad things happening? You know? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. The more yeah. you're out there, the more, the more, the more exposure you have to right. potential yeah. problems. And I am out there. But you're bouncing back. <laughs> but you bounce back from it. You get on the water. Yeah. You find that solace. Yep. And I think being able to bring that to more and more people, particularly kids, so they can find that in their lives. Right. I mean, everybody needs that. Yeah. It can't always be a video game. No. Right? The phone has got to be the worst. It's going to be the downfall of this country. Yeah. Or, or kids and, and health. Yeah. You know, I, uh, you know I, I, my girlfriend has a... a, a uh, she's a really strong believer in, in getting kids unplugged and has a program called Fit by Nature that helps kids... Um, learn about the woods and being off their phone and getting sunlight and running around and, and, and building forts and, and uh, you know, making things out of nature. Mm -hmm. You know, it's the greatest. I think it's going to be a huge deal. And she's really passionate about it. Um, those are things we need. You yeah. know, I told her, hey, if you need any fishing in there, I'll be glad to come. Down. And that's going to be a part of it, too. Sure. You know, those kids need to, everybody needs to at least get a shot at it, you know. It's a completely different universe. On the flip side of that, I find very interesting. I, I was out not long ago fishing with uh, my nephew, um, it, it, you know, fishing giant blue fins, and he just says, "Well, let me put a stick bait together." Yeah. Now I can remember when I was young, probably eighteen or nineteen years old, hearing about a stick bait and trying to figure, find out, okay, what's a stick bait? <laughs> yeah. How does this work? I know guys are catching fish, and they're, and they're, in, and they're getting them on stick baits. Right. But you had to learn by doing or being with somebody who did and right. taught you. I looked around at this stick bait he's rigging, and he just pops it together and puts it, does it, but just... Not like it's and, natural. And I'm looking at him, I said, how do you know how to do that? Right. Who showed you that? Yeah. I didn't show you that. Right. And he goes... Pulls his phone out, goes YouTube. Right there, like, yeah, oh yeah, my yeah. God, here we are. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The end of the world. Yeah. YouTube has <laughs> taken away all of the, 
you know, so we rely so much on, on, on media and on technology. It's a completely different universe. Right. I imagine you're, you know, even the bigger boats, you know, Laurent C. Didn't have chart plotters. Right. You knew where the rot was because you knew how the water reacted around right. the rock. Right. And that's how you figured out. I remember fishing with Donnie Slater. Yeah. We're in 200 feet of water. Right. And he knew exactly where he was over a, a pile. Right. But not from a chart plotter. Right. All of that's gone. It's right. changed the universe of fishing. Right. I think the technology of phones is going to have a, a huge impact on a lot of things. Some good. I have yeah. to give it that. Oh, yeah. There's definitely benefits of it. Yeah. Yeah. There, I mean, there's some upside to it, but in any event, so your uh, your um, product line, mm -hmm. we haven't spent any time really talking about. Yeah, well, I mean, basically, I mean, the the, ra the, the rattle weight. The what I what I do is I incorporate sound in all my products. Right. Right. I'm not creating the wheel here. I'm just making it better. Fish are all nearsighted. They hunt through sound and vibration. I'm pr uh, putting a sound into things that have already been around for a hundred years and just changing it the way it's made. You know, it's, 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 you, a lot of fishing stuff you see in the store has got all these flashy colors and all this stuff and it's made to catch fishermen, not fish, right? <laughs> these things that I make are for catching fish, right? You want to outsmart the biggest and the smartest fish, you got to have an edge, right? And for me, the edge is making things that they're uh, listening for. Like, mm -hmm. that's how you're going to fool them. You got to, like a fish call, like a deer call. That's how you're going to call in your big buck more often than not. Or a duck call. Mm -hmm. You're going to call your ducks in. The fish call. A moose is call. Gonna, I mean, we got right, elk. Right. It's all. I've invented the fish call. Yes. And that, you well, know. Yep. I don't know where it's going to go, right. but it works, right. right? And I've caught huge fish with it, and I've known a lot of people that have broken, like Wade Boggs broke his world record with my thing, right. uh, his bluefish world record. I know I've, I've, I've fished with people that swear by them. I don't even promote it. It goes by word of mouth. Sales are good. Um, but what it is is sound-based fishing tackle based on science. Right. It's what? not just some bearing thrown into a rattled because we, I mean, we go back, <laughs> you go back 15 years, it yeah. was a rattle trap. Right. Now, that thing made a, a rack. ridiculous amount of noise. Right. right. And it caught lots and lots of small fish. Small fish. <laughs> right. You caught big fish too. <laughs> right. But it didn't, it didn't seem to me that that particular technology targeted right. large fish. This makes perfect sense to me. Right. It's a lobster. I mean, right. I, I, mean I, I remember Norbert Stomp, who ran the Brennan and Kevin, the lobster boat out of Point Judith. Yep. Ended up working on a private boat, and he was fishing the Snug Harbor Striped Bass Tournament. Yep. And he used lobster for bait. I remember him telling me he was yeah. going to use lobster for bait. Yeah. I said, "You're out of your mind. You what are you doing?" Right. right? No. I mean. So I, you know, I've been I've been not only in the saltwater, but I've been I got uh, like drop shots for largemouth bass. Sure. With with these microscopic rattles in there, I'm thinking of buying this whole <laughs> uh, rattle building company. I don't know if I want to go that route, but uh, the drop shots, I, I make them in all different kinds of sizes for So the, ra the rattle, the rattle is this eye. The rattle is inside the, yep. It's inside it's the, inside, inside it's the a tiny, rattle. It's a tiny rattle that, uh, so, so crayfish make a sound that smallies and largemouth listen right. for, right. And, and this is it. The clicking. Right. Yep. Right. Yep. You know, no and, and, and the, the, you know, the, even a bass jig. Yeah, there's never been one made with a, a rattle that sounds like crayfish in it. Sure. It's a crayfish jig. Right. Why doesn't it sound like a crayfish? <laughs> and I was like, sure. You know, I walked in the shark tank and Mark Cuban says, how come no one else has thought of that? I said, because no one's as smart as me, being a wise ass. <laughs> but I'm like, why didn't anyone think of it, I'm thinking? Well, you know, some guys, the bass guys did. They used glass eyes. Yep. On, on their Carolina rigs, yeah. when they're you know, so sound, they get that sound they get that glass clicking noise, right. which is fairly close to this, but yeah. not quite. Yep. It does it's it's slightly different. They use that to attract, but they haven't incorporated it into a line of, a, a line, line of products product. all the way across the spectrum. Right. Yeah. I mean, there there is a rattle used for mako shark fishing, or was I, years I ago. I catch all my sharks with rattles. Right. But they had that plastic rattle. It just didn't sound. Right. I mean, you know, right. it, it doesn't it sound it wasn't unnatural. Science based. Right. 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 Absolutely. 
fantastic. Great stuff. I mean, I'm going to reach through. So That's a rattle bucktail. The same set, uh, the same rattle that goes in the rattle sinker, goes into my bucktails, goes into my blackfish jigs, goes into my rattle sinkers, goes into my floats. That's I make rattle floats. Uh, I mean, I got a stinger jig right here with a rattle, two rattles in there. Hmm. I got all different sizes and colors. Um, man, we got everything. I just, like I said, I'm not making the wheel. I'm just making it better. Yep. There it is. So you start out with really, as I understand it, prior to Mark Cuban getting involved, mm -hmm. you're at shows. You're hired to come in to speak. Yep. And drilling weights and putting, <laughs> and getting them down there and yeah. selling them as quick as you can get. Yep. And then from mm -hmm. there, well, prior to that, you formed the Striper, the World Record Striper Company. Yep, WorldRecordStriperCompany.com. That's that's our storefront. Right. That's the only place to get them right now. There it is. Uh, hopefully, um, that'll be all over the place soon. Yep, yep. So you kick that off. You end up doing Cuban. We talked a little bit about that. Yep. Or the or Shark Tank. Uh -huh. he, 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 he buys in. He funds you. He gets you going. The relationship relationship continues today. Yep. You're still working with them. You have the opportunity, or you have the ability, I should say. If big order comes in, yeah, you're not going to have production problems. You're going to have the ability to turn and burn and get that thing done. Yep. The book's born to fish. Right. Tim Gallagher and Greg Myers. Yeah, Tim Gallagher was hired to write it with me. Uh, I skipped a lot of English when I was a kid to yep. go fishing. Yep. So now, <laughs> so now it came time to write a book. You know, what was I going to do? I couldn't write it myself. I mean, I can barely. And I'm going to tell you, it's not a book about the, the the mechanics of fishing. No, it's a book about how someone became a great fisherman. Right. And and, and, and the story that leads up to sitting here ultimately. Right. right. I told right. my daughter not to read it till she was 27. Right. <laughs> there you go. There's a lot of history in there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 I mean, you know, that's just the stuff I put in there. Sure. Right. Uh, right. There's uh, plenty more out there. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, I'm I'm no angel. Uh, I never claimed to be. You know, had a rough upbringing, uh, youth, and been through some stuff. But uh, you know, I think by the grace of God and fishing, I turned out as good as I did. And like I said, I'm no prize. Right. You know, but I'm not the worst guy in the world. And I'm an old man now. You know. So I'm a lot more mellow than I was. But yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, I can tell you from my personal experience with you, and uh, not long ago, uh, I went through some very difficult and trying times. I remember. And you stepped straight up to me, uh, offered to you know manage my boat, take my boat up, you know whether, whether it was up here. I'm in North Carolina now. Yeah. That's where we, where we base out of. We're strictly tournament fishing at this point. Yep. Yeah. <clears throat> and uh, I can say that. Uh, Whatever you've been through, it's made you a stronger, more compassionate human being. I appreciate that. And and that's uh, that's uh, what I strive to be. You know, you know, my girlfriend would say that. Um, she would say otherwise. But uh, <laughs> I told her last night. You know, I'm working on that. I'm working on. I'm constantly working on. It. You can only work on yourself a little bit every day. Fantastic. You know. Well, Greg, we're going to have you back many, many times. Good. Uh, we got I'm a lot more to, to talk here. about. I like There's being a whole, here. You guys a whole are good lot guys. out there. And uh, go get them, son. Yeah, man. Right. Nice talking with you. Absolutely. The only thing I'm going to add is yeah. that a lot of people, um, fishing's what they do. I think for some folks, I know for myself, and clearly for you, it's not what we do, it's who we are. Right. And you stay focused on that. Right. Take care of the water, take care of your fish, and they're going to be there for a lot of folks. That's right. So you keep at it. All right, thank you. I will.